All right, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to finish out chapter two today, our discussion of alkanes, our first functional group, talking about cyclic alkanes here. Okay, so just to put down an example of an alkane, right, that was just our carbons and hydrogens, all single bonds. A cyclic alkane is going to be the same, all carbons and hydrogens, all single bonds, but there's at least one ring structure in that molecule. All right, let's vary geometry here. We're going to have these different shapes that we're looking at. All right, um, in terms of our reading of our bond line structures, the name of the game is still the same. All right, so everybody take a second and give me the chemical formula for this cyclic alkane here. Okay, so again, endpoints and intersections. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this structure. And if I go through, each of these carbons already has two carbon-carbon bonds. So how many hydrogens are they each going to need? Two. Two. Okay. So C6H12 will be my formula here. All right. So we talked about alkanes in this same sort of group. We're going to talk about cyclic alkanes, and that's because they behave very similarly. Uh, like we said, we can talk about our physical properties. Whoops. Okay, these are also going to be what? Polar or nonpolar molecules? Nonpolar, right? Only carbons and hydrogens. This is about as nonpolar as you can get here, right? So just like alkanes, cyclic alkanes are very nonpolar. All right, and just like we talked about with our alkanes, that means that they have low boiling points compared to other functional groups, right? Very weak intermolecular interactions. Okay, uh, in terms of boiling points, our cyclic alkanes tend to have a little bit higher of a boiling point than straight chain alkanes. Okay, and so the question of why is simply because when you create this ring, you've sort of created this surface and there's more surface area that's on these molecules. So why? Because they have a little more surface area. Okay, that said, that's a pretty minimal effect in the, you know, just to sort of for reference here, the boiling point of this hexane, this straight chain molecule here, is around 70 degrees Celsius, whereas the boiling point for this cyclic alkane with the same number of carbons is about 80 degrees Celsius. So not like a crazy difference, but you do see a little bit of an increase in boiling point when we link these two up and create a ring here. Cool, all right, so with every new functional that group that we introduce, 
And this part, first unit is particularly heavy on this. We got to talk about how to name it. All right, and so similar to before, we're going to start with like our most basic example, and then we'll make things a little bit more complicated from there. So let's start out with our hexagon here. All right, so these four steps in our nomenclature are always the same four steps. And that very first step is you got to find what? Parent chain, right? The longest continuous set of carbons. So just like always, we're going to find our parent chain. Okay? And for these cyclic alkanes, it's actually particularly easy to find your parent chain because your parent chain is going to always be that ring. Okay, so if you see a ring in that molecule, that's your parent chain. It doesn't matter if it is the longest continuous set or not. The ring kind of takes priority. All right, now, I'm lying to you a little bit. There are more complicated situations where the ring is not the parent mm -hmm. chain. We're going to just gloss over all that crap, all right? For our purposes, we're going to look at kind of a simple set of these molecules where that indeed is the case, okay? So in this molecule here, if I'm going to find my parent chain, again, pretty straightforward, it's always going to be that ring. So these one, two, three, four, five, six carbons here. What prefix do we use for our six carbons? Hex, Hex right? Cool. So if it was a straight chain, it would be just hexane. All right, for our rings, for our cyclic alkanes, you're going to stick the word cyclo in front of it. So cyclo, however many carbons, and then that same a-N-E ending. All right, so we're going to use those exact same prefixes that we learned with our alkanes for the number of carbons. Okay, so this ring with six carbons here would be named what? Cyclohexane, right? And again, you run it all together, all one word. There are no spaces in our nomenclature. So cyclohexane. All right, so let's take another example here. We're going to draw a box. But now we're going to add a substituent to that box. Um, what's my parent chain in this molecule here? Box. The box, exactly, that ring, right? So in this case, how many carbons are in that parent chain? These one, two, three, four carbons. But of course, the whole name of the game in nomenclature is we account for everything in our molecule. So now we have these two carbons in what we would call our substituent. So that's always step two, is we're going to find and name our substituents. All right, and we got nothing special to add here. There's nothing that you do differently. We know how to name this two carbon substituent. What would this be called? Ethyl. So this would be an ethyl group, right? Two carbons is that eth prefix. And then YL, since it's just carbons and hydrogens. All right. So now we got to number that parent chain. OK. And this is where the ring can kind of be a pain in the butt. When we did our straight chains, there were only two ways to do it, right to left, left to right. Okay? 
For a cyclic alkane, where do I start? Do I go clockwise, counterclockwise? There's no rule about clockwise, counterclockwise, because remember, I, this molecule is not stuck in 2D here. I can pick it up and flip it over, all right? So instead, your name of the game is to always just put the lowest number in the name. So this is what we were doing before, but again, we want the lowest number in our name, okay? So I'm gonna take this example, I'm gonna move it to a page where I got a little bit more space. All right, so what do we think should be carbon one on our chain here? The one with that ethyl group on there, right? So this would be carbon one, okay? Awesome, so now let's say that I took that ethyl group and I picked it up and I moved it over here. Now what do we think we want to be carbon one? The bottom left, right? So if you only have one substituent, you're always going to put it on carbon one, right? Because again, you could pick any carbon around that ring to start out with. So if there's only one thing on that ring, one substituent, it's always going to go on carbon one. And because of that, we know it's on carbon one. So we don't have to build that one into the name, all right? So in our example here, this wouldn't be one ethyl cyclobutane. I know that one ethyl group is going to be on carbon one. So this is just ethyl cyclobutane. Okay, so we're gonna have to distinguish here between what we're gonna call mono substituted If there's only one substituent, you do not include the locant in the name. And again, why? Because it's always on carbon one. Right? But if you have more than one substituent, then you do have to include them. Because now you've got to tell how they're oriented about that ring, right? So then we can say, what about poly substituted? Here we do include our locants. So let's just do another example here. We're going to take that six membered ring. All right, we're going to do two examples. I'm going to put two methyl groups on that ring. In my first example, I'm going to put them right next to each other. Okay, and then my next example, I'm gonna put them on opposite sides of the ring. All right, everybody take a second, see if you can't name these two molecules for me.
right? So both of these have that same parent chain. What's that parent chain? Cyclohexane, yep. Cool. But now I have these two methyl groups. Each one are a methyl group, so I can name them. But now I need to do my numbering here. All right, so I'm just going to pick one of them to be carbon one. And then I'm going to first number in the clockwise direction. But again, there's no rule that it always has to be clockwise. So I'm also going to number in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, so which one of these numbering schemes do I want to pick, red or blue? Blue, and why blue? The lowest number in the name, right? Same name of the game we were doing before. We just want the lowest possible numbers in our name. So here I have methyl groups on carbon one and two, one and two, uh, one, two, and then what do I have to include because it's two methyl groups? Dimethyl. So one, two, dimethyl cyclohexane. All right, if I play the same game over here, you see this one, it doesn't matter which one I pick, it's the same either way. So this would be the 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane. Cool, yeah, so we'll do that example next, right? Yeah, so these were both methyl groups. Importantly, if you have more than one of the same group, you're gonna use that prefix di, tri, tetra, okay? But now, yes, let's do one. We're gonna do a triangle. So I have a one carbon group on the top, and then these are four carbons over here. So what is my parent chain? Yeah, so look, even though this is more carbons, your parent chain is always the ring. Okay? All right, so then this would be a methyl group. This with four carbons is what? A butyl group, right? That prefix but, followed by that YL. Okay, now I can pick any one of these to start numbering at. So I'm going to go one, two, three, or one, two, three. Which one do I want? Blue. Right, definitely the blue. I don't want these to be three carbons apart. Cool, but I'm not done there. I have another numbering scheme that I could do starting at that butyl group. So instead I could go, and let's, let's be honest, we can kind of see we should be going this way. So in my blue numbering scheme, I would have a one and a two in the name. And in my red numbering scheme, I would have a one and a two in the name. So now we have a tie, and this is kind of this special case scenario. How do we break our tie? Alphabetical, Alphabetical order, all right? And this will play an outside, it, it's a very rare occurrence when you have a straight chain alkane. It's way more common when you have a cyclic alkane, because if I have two groups on there, I can always number from one to the other or vice versa, right? So breaking our order here with our tie, with our uh, alphabetical order is, is going to be important. So which one should be correct, red or blue? Red, right? I want the lowest number to be first in alphabetical order. So this would be one butyl, two methyl, and what's the triangle? 
cyclopropane. Cool. All right. So let me just put down one more example that I want y'all to work through, and then we'll do it together. Try to do this one on your own. So it would basically just be those three steps for naming it, correct? Well, yeah, and then I guess we always have the last step, which to, is to assemble. Okay. All right, which is where we put it in alphabetical order. So we assemble the name, our substituents go in alpha order. Right, so always the same four steps. If we just want to review here, we have added to our parent chain step how to deal with these cyclic alkanes. Again, the ring is always your parent chain. And to name it, it goes cyclo, then the number of prefixes followed by that ane suffix. Right, so you just stick the word cyclo in compared to what we were doing for our regular alkanes. Nothing different about finding your substituent. The really weird thing is the numbering of your parent chain and that if you only have one substituent, you don't bother including it in the name, the one in the name. But if you have two, you do have to include it, right? So mono substituted, we're not going to include the locant. Poly substituted, we have to include the locant, okay? All right, cool. So one more example here. Okay, so I got my parent chain, that ring. I got my two carbon substituent is an ethyl group. This one has five, what would that one be? A pentyl group. 
okay? So then I'm either gonna number starting at my ethyl group or go the other way starting at my pentyl group. In each case, I get a tie. So how do I break that tie? Alphabetical order, so which will come first? So one ethyl, two pentyl, cyclo, pentane. Cool. All right, so now we're going to complicate things. We're going to talk about what's called stereochemistry. What's up? Uh, yeah. Okay, so that list is for when you have more than one of the same type of group. So dimethyl, trimethyl, etc. right? But when you're talking about the number of carbons, not the number of substituents, but the number of carbons, that was our meth, F, prop, but, pent, etc., etc. Uh, group, right? So when you're indicating the number of carbons in that substituent, you use this list here. When you have multiple identical substituents, that's the other list. You have multiple prefixes, just for fun. Yeah, you can have pentapental. That would be a ridiculously large molecule, but yes. I have never seen one in the wild, but in theory we could draw it. You could do pentapental cyclopentane, actually, yeah. All right, so stereochemistry. So stereochemistry arises when any time we have two molecules with the same what's called connectivity of atoms. but their bonds point in different directions. Okay, with alkanes, we don't have to worry about stereochemistry which is a little bit of a lie. In a uh, two-semester course, you would talk about something called chirality, which is the stereochemistry of alkanes. It's a huge pain in the ass, so I'm super happy to just gloss over that, and we're not going to worry about that, OK? But with cyclic alkanes, you do have to worry about this, OK? So first of all, what's the big difference between alkanes and cyclic alkanes? Cyclic alkanes cannot rotate. So atoms, molecules, we draw them as like this like rigid structure on the paper. Importantly, that is not what a molecule is doing. They are always moving and dancing and bending and stretching and all that sort of stuff. There's always motion. Unless you're all the way at absolute zero where all motion ceases, anytime you got any amount of temperature, you have your bonds and your molecules are kind of wiggling around. All right? So if we were to draw, for example, as our alkane hexane, this is the way that 99.9% .9 of the time that you will see hexane drawn. But this molecule can rotate about every single one of these bonds. And if you had a sample of hexane, it would just be sitting there moving around, bending and stretching and all this sort of stuff, right? So an equivalent way of drawing the structure of hexane would be if I had my six carbons but now I start drawing them in all these different orientations in space, right? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons. This is still just hexane. It's just a different, what we would call rotational conformation. I just bent one of those bonds, rotated this molecule in space. And again, if you have a sample of hexane, it's not sitting here all rigid. 
it's always flopping around and bending about all of those bonds, rotating about all of those bonds, right? So these are both the same molecule. This is hexane, this is hexane. These are just different rotational conformations. Now the reason why we tend to default to this one right here is because it's the most stable. Molecules like to spread themselves out, but importantly they're not frozen in that position, right? They're always going to be rotating about their bonds. Well, all of a sudden when I take my cyclic alkane, and I link up those two ends, Now they're stuck. Now they can't rotate anymore. This molecule's still going to kind of like vibrate and jiggle around, but it can't freely rotate about these bonds because I froze them into place with this ring structure here. So these bonds here cannot rotate. Okay. And importantly, how many hydrogens are there on each one of these carbons? Two. Two. All right. So what's going to happen is when we form our ring here, there's going to be these two bonds. They're not both pointed in the same direction. One of them is going to be pointed up away from the ring. The other one's going to be pointed down. All right. And so we have ways of drawing these specific bond orientations using what are called dashed and wedged bonds. Oops. These are an extra piece of information when you're looking at a structure that tells you which direction the bond is pointed in that structure. So we're going to use these bonds to show which direction bonds are pointing. Okay, and we got two different types. We have our wedged bonds. We draw those as these little bold triangles. Okay, your wedge represents a bond that's pointed out at y'all, right? Pointed out of the page in this direction here. The other type are the dashed bonds. They're a little bit harder to draw on nice and neat. Sort of progressively getting larger lines. These are bonds that are pointed into the page. So previously we did this example of dimethylcyclohexane. All right, and we use these straight bonds here. Okay? We could have even more information about the direction that these methyl groups are pointed. 
We could draw it where both methyl groups are pointed out of the page, sticking out at you. By putting both of those methyl groups on these dashed or on these wedged bonds. We could put them both on dashed bonds so that they're pointed into the page. All right, or they could be pointed in opposite directions, where one's pointed out at you, and the other one is pointed into the page. Okay, so these are three ways of drawing that one, two dimethyl cyclohexane. If it's just our normal straight lines here, that means you don't know the way that they're pointed. Or more likely, you have a mixture of both possible conformations. Right? So if you ever see something like this without dashes and wedges, that just simply means we do not know the stereochemistry. And that is very, that's, that's very often the case. Okay, stereochemistry is very hard to determine. They do have some fancy instruments, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to get at. Okay, but if you do have dashed and wedges, then you can determine the stereochemistry. This is a ring where these two molecules are not the same. These are distinct molecules. They have different physical properties, different boiling points, different melting points. Now, they're not going to be very different. They're going to be super freaking close together. But they are, in fact, distinct molecules with their own chemical behaviors. What's up? So if the, uh, on the one on the right, if the dash switch was a red on that, would that also be a different molecule from? No, it would be the same. So the, the big deal is are they pointed in the same direction or are they pointed in opposite directions? All right, and basically we're going to have fancy terminology for which orientation you have here. Okay. Cool. So point being, they have different molecules, different physical properties. Okay, and because of that, according to our nomenclature scheme, we should name them differently. They're both 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexanes. So instead, we're going to stick this little thing on the front of them to indicate that stereochemistry. All right? So we call it the cis isomer. When the bonds pull, uh, point in the same direction. And we call it the trans isomer when they point in opposite directions. Okay. So because our ring is this rigid structure and it has these two bonds, these two bonds could be pointed in either direction. And if we have this information, if we have our dashes and wedges drawn, we should be able to convey that information using these prefixes here. All right. So if I were to name this molecule, it is 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane, but specifically this is the cis 1,2. Dimethyl cyclohexane. Uh, your stereochemistry goes out front with a dash between the letters and the numbers. Okay? Um, just to be clear, if these were both wedges, this would also be the cis conformation. That's the same molecule, right? Pointed in the same direction, 
they're going to be the cis isomer pointed in different directions is the trans isomer. All right, so then let's practice all of this business here with our stereochemistry. I'm going to put down a few examples. All right, again, you're going to name these for me, but they'll have that added challenge of including that stereochemistry as well. That hopefully was what I put. Yeah, okay. But yes, cyclohexane. Okay, real quick, let me just show you this kind of weird structure here. When we're drawing these functional groups that have more than one carbon, the first bond is there to tell us which direction it's pointed, and then we just continue drawing our carbons like normal in our straight chain, right? So this would be a substituent that has one, two, three carbons on there. That's how you would draw a multiple carbon substituent. You show the direction of that first bond because it's got to be pointed up or down, right? But after that, you just keep on drawing it like normal. Cool. All right. So yeah, take a second and name these two molecules for me. And yes, this is a seven-membered ring on the right, which is a particularly pain in the butt uh, shape to draw. But yeah, just do your best. We're not artists in here. Don't worry. Some of you maybe, I don't know your life, but it's a tough shape to draw.
questions. All right, let's do this one first. Step one is to just name it without paying attention to dashes and wedges. All right, we're just going to make sure to find our parent chain, our cyclopentane. We have these two one carbon substituents. So this is a methyl group, and this is a methyl group. All right, they're all the same, so I can just pick one and start numbering. I want to go that direction, not the other direction, because I want them to be 1, 3 and not 1, 4. Okay? So 1, 3, dimethyl. Oops. Cyclohexapentane. But now since I'm given this extra piece of information with these dashed and wedge bonds, I gotta specify the stereochemistry of this molecule, either cis or trans. Which one is this one? They're pointed in the same direction. In this case, they're both pointed into the board, but again, they're pointed in the same direction. So this would be the cis dash one three dimethyl cyclopentane. All run together, all one word. What's up? Either one would be equivalent, because look, if I grabbed a spatula and I flipped this thing over like a pancake, all of a sudden both of those bonds would be pointed at you. So it's literally the identical molecule, right? Just, just drawn on the page differently. Cool. All right, so this one, again, this is this pain in the butt seven-membered ring. Okay, which would be what parent chain? Cycloheptane. All right. I have this is a two carbon substituent, so this is an ethyl group. The other one is a three carbon substituent, so it's a propyl group. Okay, I can number one, two, three, four, or I could go the other direction one, two, three, four. Which one of these am I going to pick, red or blue? Red. Right, so in this case, it's a tie. It's a one and four no matter what. So we break that tie with our alphabetical order. And E comes before P in the alphabet. So this would be one ethyl, four propyl, cycloheptane. But again, I'm given this additional piece of information about the orientation of the propyl group compared to the ethyl group. And this would be which of our two stereoisomers? So this would be, and again, just goes out front, trans dash, one ethyl, four propyl cycloheptane. Again, these names just roll off the tongue. All right, cool. So that's, that's our discussion of alkanes. Um, reactions of cyclic alkanes are the exact same as regular alkanes, which gives us a chance to go practice another radical halogenation reaction, because these are probably the toughest thing that we've learned thus far in our course. All right. So let's just use the remainder of our class period here to practice drawing, uh, to practice these types of reactions here. Uh, let's do a somewhat simple one at first and then we'll complicate things a little bit. All right, I'll keep it formatted similar to what you see on your homework where it draws out these halogens specifically. So what is our substrate in our reactions in organic chemistry? So it's going to be the ones, when we call substrate, we're talking about the organic molecule in the reaction, right? 
Uh, your chemical reactions in organic chemistry will require an organic molecule, and then you usually treat it with some inorganic acid, or in this case, halogen, or whatever it may be. Your substrate is that organic molecule. And your reagent is what you treat it with. And this particular reaction requires a catalyst, which would just be H nu, which stands for what? Light, right? And then for our product here, what should we be looking at in the functional group of our products of this reaction? Al alkyl halide, yep. So I'm going to stick a halogen on that molecule. So step one, in terms of drawing the product or of any reaction, you want to know what you're expecting to see on the other side, right? We're going to be putting bromines onto our molecule, okay? Um, an important sort of basis of any chemistry, you're going to hear me say, count your carbons. I'm going to start out with this four carbon chain here. All of my products better have four carbons in it, right? We don't lose a carbon. Carbon doesn't magically get turned into bromine or anything like that. However many carbons we start with, we should have that on the other side as well, okay? So the easiest thing to do, because step one that I can ask you here is to draw all possible products. All right, in these reactions, you get a mixture of products depending on which carbon gets substituted. We want to draw all possible products. All right, so everybody take a minute, see if you can't draw me all possible products, and then we'll go through it together. Each of your products should have four carbons and one bromine in there as well. We're not adding both bromines, just one bromine. Uh, it's going to be important that you don't draw the same product twice, right? You can't draw the same molecule twice. A good sort of hint or whatever tip is to redraw your molecule just like you saw it above, right? If I start rotating this thing around in space, all of a sudden it's harder to keep track of what, who's who. So I'm just going to copy it exactly as is, and I'm going to stick on this first carbon here a bromine. Cool, check, check, that's one of them, all right? I stuck a bromine on one of my carbons, I still have four carbons, and I have one bromine in there. Cool, so then let's move down the line. I'm going to now pick this carbon, and I'm gonna substitute one of the hydrogens on there for a bromine. Okay. And let me just re-emphasize what I said here when I did my reaction. I substituted one of the hydrogens from my substrate, and I added a bromine in its place, right? And this is one of the easy things to get lost of in our bond line structures, since we're not explicitly drawing our hydrogens. We want to be able to see that on my reactant, on my substrate, I have two hydrogens, and then on my product, I only have one because now I've replaced one with a bromine, right? So that's what we're doing in our reaction. We're plucking off a hydrogen and replacing it with one of those halogens, okay? 
So again, we call these substitution reactions, something that's hard to see since we don't draw our hydrogens, but just let's make sure that we can see it. Cool. So then if I keep going and I pick this one here, Now I have right here, okay? But let's be careful here. I have drawn the same structure twice. Okay, I can't include both of those as products. I've drawn the same thing, all right? Um, and to be clear, how can we see that? Well, if I just rotate this thing around, notice how it's the same as what I just drew before, right? So. I'm not going to include these as distinct carbons. And I'm going to be really good. And I'm going to keep track of it with colors. Okay, this isn't going to be a different carbon here. This needs to be an orange carbon. Because both would give me that orange product here. All right, if you're taking your notes on pencil and paper, you can also label this as, for example, I colored it red. You could say this is product A and label your carbons uh, accordingly. But it's important to keep track of which carbon in your substrate leads to which product. Okay, that's going to be for the next step here. But nonetheless, you want some system to keep track of who's who. So again, I'm sort of coloring things. I have my red product if I put it on that first carbon. I have my orange product if I put it on my second carbon. I would also get my orange carbon if I put it on my third carbon. All right, so I can either color these or let's label this A and B. So both of these would be B's in my uh, original substrate here. Both of these would lead me to this product. Okay. And then I do the last one, but that's not going to be its own group. What group should that be in? A. A, right? That should also be in that red group. Cool. So step one, I have my two possible products with no duplicates. All right, but now we're going to calculate our percent distribution or composition. Distribution is probably more correct. Anyways, of products. So I don't want to just say that these are my two products. I want to say I'm going to get 30% of this guy and 70% of the other guy or whatever it may be, whatever the math works out to. Okay. Cool. So the key here is we're going to take our two products and for each one we need to figure out how many hydrogens belong in each one of those groups. Okay? And I'm not talking about how many hydrogens once I've drawn my product. I'm talking about in my substrate here, these hydrogens that are going to be replaced. So if we look at group A, how many hydrogens live in group A? total six. six I got three on this carbon and three on this carbon that means there's a total of six hydrogens that I could choose from that would all give me that same product so number of hydrogens six for the red group and what about the orange group Four. two on each so again two here two here so there's a total of four hydrogens I could choose from that would give me that same product All right, and there are these two parts of this calculation. The one is the number of hydrogens, and the other is what we call the reactivity factor. And the reactivity factor is unique to your halogen. So in this case, our halogen is bromine. So I'm going to go to that little table that we created. Okay. This is our reactivity factors. And we can see that it differs depending on whether we're talking about a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary carbon. All right, so let me just kind of squeeze this in here. So that red group, what reactivity factor would I use? Is that a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon? Primary. So then I'm going to go for bromine. A primary carbon has a reactivity factor of 1. 
And what about my orange carbon? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Secondary. secondary. So my reactivity factor for a secondary carbon with bromine is 82. Okay? So now we're going to calculate number of hydrogens times that reactivity factor. All right, six times one, I'm pretty confident about, that's six. Four times 82 is 328. So then in order to get my percent distribution here, I'm going to take my number of hydrogens times the reactivity factor and divide it by the sum of everybody here. So my 6 plus my 328. Let me see if I can squeeze this in. Okay, times 100, my bad, percents. Okay, so um, we're going to round this to the ones place, as it says in our homework. That would mean that 2% of my product is the one bromobutane, and 98% is that two bromobutane. Okay? And again, the number of hydrogens in each group, I'm not just looking at the number of hydrogens that are on my product here, I'm going back to my original molecule here, right? So again, keeping track of which carbon in your substrate is going to uh, lead to which product is important. Cool. All right, so let's do another one here. Where do one of our cyclic alkanes? Yeah. And I it was kind of confusing just because we never went over it on a Thursday. On we hadn't see we hadn't like drawn or named our cyclic alkanes, but yeah. yeah. I mean, hopefully you can still see whether you've drawn the same structure twice.
So you should have three distinct products if you've got them all correct. Okay, so I have my three distinct products here, okay, coming from my, each of my carbons. Again, I've sort of colored them here so we can see. I have my red product, or we'll call this product A. That would be either of these carbons here. I have my orange product, or we can call that product B. And I have my green carbon, uh, green product, which would come from either of these two, C. Okay. Um, I have sort of hesitated to use this term because I feel like it might be more confusing than it's worth. But you can sort of see based on this molecule here that there's this like plane of symmetry that runs down here, which is why those atoms all fall in that same group. I don't know if that helps or hurts, but. Um, if you look for symmetry in your molecule, that can also give you a clue. Okay, so now I need to do my calculations here. Again, I'm going to do my red group, my orange group, and my green group, or A, B, and C. And for each one, I need the number of hydrogens and then that reactivity factor. Okay, and again, I'm not looking at my products, I'm looking at my original substrate and I'm asking how many hydrogens are in group A? How many hydrogens? Six, what about group B? There's only two and then C, four. Okay, so six, two, and four for our number of hydrogens. Okay, and then I'm gonna look up my reactivity factor. Um, this is gonna depend on whether we're looking at a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon. So for group A, primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary, so that would be a reactivity factor of one. What about my orange carbon? Tertiary, and we're talking about chlorine, so I'm going to use that 5.2 value. And then lastly, our green carbon, secondary. And that would be, what is that, 3.9? Yes. So then I'm going to multiply these together. 6 and 1 is 6. We got 10.4. 15.6. So then to get my percent, I'm going to take each of those values and divide it by the sum of each of them together, which is 32. Multiply by 100. Cool. 
So I would get 19% for my red product, that group A product. I would get 32.5 or 33% for product B and 49% for product C here. So which one is the major product of this reaction? C. So even though C is a secondary carbon and secondary carbons are less reactive than tertiary carbons, that's not the only part of this calculation. The number of hydrogens factors in there as well, right? So the fact that I have four hydrogens in group C versus just two in group B is what leads me to uh, this being my major product. We can see with bromine, because of our values, bromine is way more selective, right? Because it's got a huge number for the tertiary. But with chlorine, it's, it's not as straightforward because those numbers are much more similar. So again, you always got to do the math to figure out what your major product's going to be. Okay? Cool. All right. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. When you name that last product that we did, does the chloro go first or You want the lowest number first? So it would be the one, two, three. So two chloro, one, three dimethyl. Yeah. Yeah, so only when it's a tie in the numbering, if you started with that chloro group as carbon one, you would end up with a big number in the name, right? You would end up one, two, three, four. You could do it with less one, two, three. Uh, two chloro, one three dimethyl cyclobutane. Okay, that's where I was. I had a question. Yeah. Um, I was able to finish this uh, question.